When It Changed by Joanna Russ. Katie drives like a maniac. We must have been doing over 120 kilometers per hour on those turns. She's good, though, extremely good. I've seen her take the whole car apart and put it back together again in a day. My birthplace on while away was largely given to farm machinery, and while I refused to wrestle with a five gear shifted on holy speeds, not having been brought up to it, but even on those turns in the middle of the night on a country road as bad as our, our district can make them, Katie's driving doesn't scare me. The funny thing about my wife, though, she will not handle guns. She has gone hiking in the forest above 48th parallel without firearms for days at a time, and that does scare me. Katie and I have three children between us, one of hers, two of mine. Yuriko, my eldest, was asleep in the back seat, dreaming 12-year-old dreams of love and war, running away to sea, hunting in the north, dreams of strangely beautiful people and strangely places, beautiful places. <laughs> All, all the wonderful gruff you, guff you think of when you're turning 12, and the glands start going. Someday soon, like all of them, she will disappear for weeks on end and come back grimy and proud, having knifed her first cougar, shot her first bear, dragging some un abominably dangerous dead beastie behind her, which I will never forgive her f for what it might have done to my daughter. Yuriko says Katie's driving puts her to sleep. For someone who has fought three duels, I am... I am afraid of far, far too much. I'm getting old. I told this to my wife. You're 34, she said. Laconic to the point of silence, that one. She flipped the lights on on the dash. Three kilometers to go. The road was getting worse all the time. Far out in the country, electric green trees rushed to our headlights and around the car. I reached down next to where we bolt the carrier panel to the door and ease my rifle into my lap. Yuriko stirred in the back, my height but Katie's eyes, Katie's face. The car engine is so quiet, she says, that you can hear breathing in the back seat. Yuki had been alone in the car when the message came, Enthusi enthusiastically decoding her dot dashes, silly to mount a wide frequency receiver near an IC engine, but most of wh while away is on steam. She had thrown herself out of the car, my gangly and gaudy offspring, shouting at the top of her lungs. So, of course, she had come along. We had been intellectually prepared for this ever since the colony was founded, ever since it was abandoned. But this was different. This was awful. Men, Yuki had screamed, leaping over the car door. They've come back. Real Earthmen. We met them in, in the kitchen of the farmhouse, near the place where they had landed. The windows were open, the night air very mild. We had passed over all sorts of transportation when we parked outside. Steam tractors, trucks, an icy flatbed, even a bicycle. Lydia, the district biologist, had come out of her northern taciturny long enough to take blood and urine samples and was sitting in a corner of the kitchen, shaking her head in astonishment over the results. She even forced herself, very big, very fair, very shy, always painfully blushing, to dig up the old language manuals, though I can... Talk to the old, I can talk the old tongues in my sleep, and do. Lydia's uneasy with us. We're Southerners, and too flamboyant. I counted twenty people in the kitchen, all the brains of the North Continent. Phyllis Spett, I think, and had come in a big glider. Yuki was the only child there. Then I saw the four of them. They are bigger than we are. They're bigger and broader. Two taller than I, and I am extremely tall. One meter and eighty centimeters in my bare feet. They are obviously of our species, but off, indescribably off, and my eyes could not and still cannot quite comprehend on the lines of these alien bodies. I could not then bring myself to touch them, though one of the one, though the one who spoke Russian, what voices they have wanted to shake hands, a custom from the past, I imagine. I can only say that they were apes with human faces. He seemed to mean well, but I found myself shuddering back almost the length of the kitchen, and I then l I laughed apologetically, and then set a good example. Interstellar uh, Midi, I thought, <laughs> did shake hands finally. A hard, hard hand. They are heavy as draft horses, blurred deep voices. Yuriko had sneaked between the adults and was gazing at the men with her mouth wide open. He turned his head, those words have not been in our language for 600 years, and said in bad Russian, Who's that? 
My daughter, I said, and added with an irrational attention to good manners we sometimes employ in moments of insanity. My daughter, Yuriko Jenetson. We use the patronomic. You would say matronomic. Matrion. He laughed involuntarily. Yuki exclaimed, I thought they would be good-looking. Greatly disappointed at this reception of herself, Phyllis Hagelson sped, who someday I shall kill, gave me across the room a cold, level, venomous look, as if to say, watch what you say, I know what I can do. It's true that I have very little formal status, but Madam President will get herself in serious trouble with both me and her own staff. She continues to consider industrial espionage good, clean fun. Wars and rumors of wars. As it says in one of our ancestors' books, I translated Yuki's words into the man's dog Russian, once our lingua franca, and the man laughed. Where are all your people, he said conversationally. I translated again and watched the faces around the room. Lydia, embarrassed, as usual, spent narrowing her eyes with some damn scheme, Katie very pale. This is while away, I said. He continued to look unenlightened. While away, I said. Do you remember? Do you have records? There was a plague on while away. He looked moderately interested. Heads turned in the back of the room, and I caught a glimpse of the local profession's parliament delegate. By morning, every town meeting, every district caucus would be in full session. Plague, he said. That's most unfortunate. Yes, I said. Most unfortunate. We lost half of our population in one generation. He looked properly impressed. <laughs> what an asshole. Uh, while away was lucky, I said. We had a big initial gene pool. We had been chosen for extreme intelligence, and we had our high technology and a large remaining population in which every adult was one, two, <laughs> two or three experts in one. The soil is good. The climate is blessedly easy. There are 30 million of us now. Things are beginning to snowball in industry. Do you understand? Give us 70 years. We'll have more than one real city, more than a few industrial centers, a few full... Full-time professions, full-time radio operators, full-time machinists. Give us 70 years, and not everyone will have to spend three-quarters of a lifetime on a farm. And I try to explain how hard it is when artists can practice full-time only in old age, and when there are so few, so very few, who can be free, like Katie and myself. I try to outline our government, the two houses, one by prof professions, the other geographic one, I told him the district caucuses handled problems too big for the individual towns, and population control was not a political issue, not yet. Though, give us time and it would be. This was a delicate point in our history. Give us time. There was no need to sacrifice quality of life for an insane rush into industrialization. Let us go at our own pace. Give us time. Where are all, our, where are all the people? said that monomaniac. I realized then that he did not mean people, he meant men. He was giving the word and meaning it had not had on while away for six centuries. They died, I said, third generations ago. I thought we had pole-waxed him. He caught his breath. He made as if to get out of the chair he was sitting in. He put his hand to his chest. He looked around us with the strangest blend of awe and sentimental tenderness. Then he said, solemnly and earnestly, a great tragedy. I waited, not quite understanding. Yes, he said, catching his breath again with a queer smile, that adult-to-child smile that tells you something is being hidden and will be presented, pre presently produced with cries of encouragement and joy. A great tragedy, but it's over. And again, he looked around at all of us with the strangest deference, as if we were invalids. You've adapted amazingly, he said. To what, I said. He looked embarrassed. He looked, frankly, and he looked inane. Finally, he said... Where I come from, the women don't dress so plainly. Like you, I said? Like a bride? For the men were wearing silver head to foot. I n had never seen anything so godly. Gaudy. He made it as if to, an uh, to answer, and then apparently thought better of it. He laughed at me again with odd exhilaration, as if we were something childish, something wonderful, as if he were doing us an enormous favor. He took one shaky breath and said, Well, we're here. I looked at Spet. Spet looked at Lydia. Lydia looked at Amalia, who was the head of the local town meeting. Amalia looked at I don't know whom. My throat was raw. I cannot stand local beer, which the farmers swill as if their stomachs had iridium linings, but I sw took it anyway, from Amalia. 
It was her bicycle that we had seen outside as we parked, and swallowed it all. This was going to be, take a long time, I said. Yes, here you are, and smiled, feeling like a fool. Wonder, and wondered seriously if male earth people's minds work so very differently from er, female earth people's minds, but couldn't be so, or the race would, uh, oh, but that couldn't be so, or the race would have died out long ago. The radio network had gotten, had got news from around the planet that now we had another Russian speaker flown in from Varna. I decided to cut out now cut out when the man passed around pictures of his wife, who looked like the priestess of some arcane cult. He proposed questions to Yuki, so I barreled her into the back room in spite of her furious protest, and went out to the front porch. As I left, Lydia was explaining the difference between parthenogenesis, which is so easy anyone can practice it, and what we do, which is the merging of the ova. That is why Katie's baby looked like me. Lydia went on to the Ansky process, and Katie Anksy uh, are one full polymath genius, and the great, great, I don't know how many times, great grandmother of our own Katharina. A dot dash transmitter in one of the outbindings chattered faintly to itself, operators flirting and passing jokes down the line. There was a man on the porch, the other tall man. I watched him for a few minutes. I can move very quietly when I want to, and when I allowed him to see me, he stopped talking into the little machine that hung around his neck. Then he said calmly, in excellent Russian, Do you know that sexual equality has been reestablished on Earth? You're the real one, I said, aren't you? The other one's for show. It was a great relief to get things cleared up. He nodded affably. As a people, we are not very bright, he said. There has been too much genetic damage in the last few centuries. Radiation, drugs. We can use while away's genes, Janet. Strangers do not call strangers by the first name. <laughs> you can have enough cells to drown in it, I said. Breed your own. He smiled. That's not the way we want to do it. Behind him, I saw Katie come into the square of light that was the screened-in door. He went on, low and urbane. Not ma... Not mocking me, I think, but with a self-confidence of someone who has always had money and strength to spare, who does not know what it is to be second class or provincial. Which is very odd, because the day before I would have said that it was the exact description of me. I am talking to you, Janet, he said, because I suspect you have a, a more popular influence than anyone else here. You know that as well as I do, that parthenogenic culture has all sorts of inherent defects. defects. And we do not, if we can help it, mean to use you for anything of the sort. Pardon me, I should not have said use, but surely you can see that this kind of society is unnatural. Humanity is unnatural, said Katie. She had my rifle under her left arm. The top of that silky head does not quite come up to my collarbone, but she is as tough as steel. He began to move, again with that queer, smiling deference, which his fellow had showed to me, but he had not. The gun slid into Katie's grip as she had as if she had shot it with all her life. Uh, I agree, said the man. Humanity is unnatural. I should know. I have metal in my teeth and metal pins here, he touched his shoulder. Seals are harem animals. Oh, yeah. He added, and so are men. Apes are promiscuous, and so are men. Doves are monogamous, and so are men. There are even celibate men and homosexual men. There are homosexual cows, I believe. Oh, uh, but while away is still missing something. He gave a dry chuckle. I will give him the credit of believing that it had something to do with nerves. I miss nothing, said Katie, except that life isn't endless. You are, said the man, nodding from me to her. Wives, said Katie, we're married. Giggity. And again, the dry chuckle. A good economic arrangement, he said, for working and taking care of the children, and as good as an arrangement for any randomizing heredity. Your reproduction is made to follow the same pattern, but Katharina Michelson... If there isn't something better that he, you might secure for your daughters, I believe in instincts, even in man. I can't think that the two of you are a mach machinist, are you? I gather you are some sort of chief of police. I don't feel somehow what even you must miss. Uh, you know it intellectually, of course. There is only a half species here. Men must come back to while away. Kitty said nothing. I should think, Katharina Michelson, said the man gently, that you, of all people, would benefit the most from such a change. And he walked past Katie's rifle and the square of light coming from the door. 
I think it was then he noticed my scar, which really does not show unless the light is from a side, a fine line that runs from my temple to my chin. Most people don't even know about it. Where did you get that, he said. I answered with an involuntary grin. In my last duel, we stood there, bristling at each other for several seconds. This is absurd, but true. Until he went inside and shut the screen door behind him. Katie said in a brittle voice, You damned fool, you don't know when we've been insulted, and swung the rifle up to shoot him through the screen, but I got to her before she could fire and knocked the rifle out of arm. It burned a hole through the porch floor. Katie was shaking. She kept whispering over and over, That's why I never touched you, because I knew I'd kill someone. I knew I'd kill someone. The first man, the one that I'd spoken with first, was still talking inside of the house. Something about the grand movement to recolonize and rediscover all that Earth had lost. He stressed the advantages to while away. Trade, exchange of ideas, education. He, too, said that sexual equality had been reestablished on Earth. Katie was right, of course. We should have burned them down where they stood. Men are coming to while away. When one culture has big guns and the other has none, there is a certain predictability about the outcome. Maybe men would have come eventually in any case. I would like to think that a hundred years from now, my great-grandchildren could have stood them off or fought them to a standstill. But even that's, but even that's no odds. I will remember all my life those four people I first met who were muscled like bulls and who made me, if only for a moment, feel small. A neurotic reaction, Katie says. I remember everything that happened that night. I remember Yuki's excitement in the car. I remember Katie sobbing when we got home, as if her heart would break. I remember her lovemaking. A little preparatory, preparatory, as always, but wonderfully soothing and comforting. I remember the prow, the prowling restless, restlessly, around the house after Katie fell asleep with one bare arm hung into a hung into a patch of light from the hall. The muscles of her forearms are like metal bars from all that driving and testing her machines. Sometimes I dream about Katie's arms. I remember wandering into the nursery, picking up my wife's baby, dozing for a while with the poignant, amazing warmth of an infant in my lap, and finally returning to the kitchen to find Yuriko fixing herself a late-night snack. My daughter eats like a great dame. Yuki, I said, do you think that you could fall in love with a man? She whooped decisively with a ten, uh, with a ten foot toad. Said my tactful child. But men are coming to while away. Lately, I sit up nights and worry about the men who will come to this planet, about my two daughters and Breda Katharinason, about what will happen to Katie, to me, to my life. Our ancestors' journals are one long cry of pain, and I suppose I ought to be glad now. One can't throw away six centuries or even, as I have lately discovered, 34 years. Sometimes I laugh at the, and at the question those four men hedged about all evening and never quite dared to ask, looking at the lot of us, hicks and overalls, farmers and canvas paints and plain shirts, which of you plays the role of the man? As if we had to produce a carbon copy of their mistakes. I doubt very much that sexual equality has been reestablished on Earth. I do not like to think of myself mocked, or of Katie deferred to as if she were weak, Yuki made to feel unimportant or silly, of my other children cheated of their humanity and, or turned into strangers, and I'm afraid that my own achievements will dwindle from what they were, or what I thought they were, to the not very interesting curiosa of the human race, the oddities you read about in the back of the book, things to laugh at s at some time because they are, more, are so exotic, quaint, but not impressive, charming, but not useful. I find this more painful than I can say. You will agree that for a woman who has fought three duels, all of them kills, indulging in such fears is ludicrous. But what's around the corner now is a duel so big, I don't think I have the guts for it. In Faust words, Verwei dosh du bist so schocken. Keep it as it is, don't change. Sometimes at night, I remember the original name of this planet, changed by the first generation of our ancestors, those curious women for whom I suppose the real name was too painful a reminder of the men who died. I find it amusing in a grim way to see it also completely turned around. This, too, shall pass. Uh, all good things must come to an end. Take a life, but don't take away the meaning of my w life. 
for a while.